Welcome to the Sri Lankan Understanding, a platform from which we explore the paths taken by Sri Lanka, an island in the Indian Ocean. We look at where the country is at present and we focus on the future and the potential of this country. Our topic for discussion today is Sri Lanka and the BRI, or the Belt and Road Initiative as it is known as, and we examine the path ahead. To do this, we have invited a person who is a professor of management, who is visiting faculty with the Kuala Lumpur University and the Chennai University. He is also a civic educator with UN United Nations. He has also been someone who has served as a technical advisor for the National Education Commission of Sri Lanka. He is a BRI resource person with China International Radio in Sri Lanka. Thank you very much, Professor Samita Hettige, for joining us on the Sri Lankan Understanding. Thank you, George. Thank it is you. indeed a pleasure. Your area has been management. Yes. How did you get into this particular area of research, of um, uh, furthering your area of expertise? Why this particular bilateral relationship, China and Sri Lanka? Well, uh, management has its components and I was focusing on conflict resolution and conflict prevention. And uh, for my doctoral studies, I took it further to organizational conflict prevention. And uh, for the latter part of your question, I'm one of those Sri Lankans who personally saw Marshal Hyang Sheng handing over the brand new BMICH to the people of Sri Lanka. Now, later on in life, when I was studying conflict resolution and prevention, I noticed, I analyzed that China has always helped Sri Lanka, all elected governments of Sri Lanka, to resolve our conflicts and prevent our conflicts. And lastly, when the Belt and Road Initiative was launched in 2013, I was in Malaysia and my university community, they were so keen on it and they were highly fo focused on it, being Malaysians. And they also encouraged me to focus on it because they knew that I was from Sri Lanka and uh, that Sri Lanka is also located in an important, uh, I would say, a nerve center down the ancient Silk Road. Mm -hmm. So that is the... That's how brought you into this particular, this bilateral relationship exactly. out of all of them. Exactly. So that's very interesting. When we look at our two countries, Sri Lanka and China, we've had a very long, distinguished past. We've interacted for centuries. This is not something that has started after we received independence or That's after right. the People's Republic of China was established in 49. If you look at some of the main milestones from then to now in our bilateral relationship, what would you highlight as some of the most critical points? Well, uh, 2,500 years ago, we had very strong relations and uh, it was Sri Lanka who helped China to establish the Bhikkhuni Sasan or the female Buddhist uh, monk establishment or the sect organization. And then later on, we got the Yapahu Alliance when it comes to architecture. We got the Ranmasu Uyana or the goldfish, the ponds with go goldfish for royalty then, but now it's a common man's uh, possession. And then later on, uh, during the ancient Silk Road, 700 years ago, Chinese Navy was the most powerful Navy in the world. And uh, Chinese Admiral Sheng He was in charge of more than 300 massive ships and a naval fleet, elite commandos of more than 20,000 men. He was uh, passing Sri Lanka on many occasions. And uh, those, especially the ancient Silk Road transactions, helped us to stabilize our, our system here 700 years back and then later on when the People's Republic of China was established we had the rubberized pact uh, at a time when they didn't even have uh, diplomatic relations with us and that pact remained until 1982 for 30 years and then right throughout our conflict China was helping us the elected governments of Sri Lanka most importantly, they never exported their politics to us. They were being good friends. And if I may quote the Chinese, they say that good friends are like stars. You don't see them always, but they are there. So I, I think China is a very good friend. That's a very valid point there in terms of that uh, saying as well, because we've seen 
irrespective of which government has been in power. It's not like China works with a particular government or party or family. Or they're, they're, not, they're not leaning towards that. They're leaning towards Sri Lanka. Exactly. They're very keen to work with the country. That's and right. I guess that's also a lot to do with our geographical positioning, our historic connectivity. And those are some facts that we need to uh, bear in mind there. And also, they have never interfered in the matters of any other nation for that po um, point. So it's not only Sri Lanka? Not only Sri Lanka. I will talk about it. In Th that's a very, very uh, interesting area there because that's a country that does not interfere and they don't want you to interfere in their affairs either. Exactly. It's, it's a mutually uh, beneficial arrangement uh, of uh, sorts which they want to try to, try to preserve and yes. try to ensure that it takes place. And in they have a very interesting and a very effective way of uh, developing that is which they call win-win cooperation. They want the others to win and they all they want to win so and they tr focus on trade which benefits both parties which i think is the most effective way in the current uh, situation as well absolutely because when we're looking to the future trade is going to become one of the most critical connectors because at the end of the day globalization has brought all of us together simply because we trade with each other exactly. we rely on each other exactly. we are not we are independent but we are not countries that manage entirely on our own. We don't have that capacity. I don't think anybody has that capacity. Exactly. Yes. And this is where everyone, irrespective of your size, your amount of power, your potential influence on the world stage, uh, that level of cooperation is something that has to really be understood uh, in the proper context. When we return, we're going to be looking at some of the challenges in the 21st century how we are dealing with this relationship, how we are looking at the bilateral connectivity between the two countries here in 2021 and as we progress into the third decade of this century. When we return with the Sri Lankan understanding, we're in conversation with Professor Samita Hettige and we're talking about Sri Lanka and the BRI and we're examining the path ahead. Welcome back to the Sri Lankan Understanding. We're in conversation with Professor Sanita Hettige and we're talking about Sri Lanka and the BRI and examining the path ahead. Before we went to the break, Professor, we talked about certain aspects of what it has been like in the past, key milestones, and you identified whether it was ancient times and the sea voyages that took place, the marine connectivity between our countries, the religious connectivity between our two countries, but also we came into the trade aspect of it. Now we are in the 21st century. How do you see us progressing with this country? China is rising very rapidly on the world stage. But it's a country with which we have maintained ties long before it came to this particular position. I think that is also a key factor for us to understand. But where do you think we are today? How would you assess the relationship at present? Well, yes. As you said, the relations goes back to the time of Great China or Mahachina. Then they established the People's Republic of China and uh, it was us who opened up our economy in the late 1970s and the former president of China Jiang Zemin as the mayor of Shanghai which is their center for international transactions came here as the mayor to study the Greater Colombo Economic Commission and went back and they started opening up their economy uh, Shenzhen was the first ever attempt. Now Shenzhen is uh, Asia's fifth largest economy. It's uh, more than the Singaporean GDP. So with the 21st century, I think China has reciprocated that honor. Where they, where they came and learned from us. They gave us back so much investment. Like for example, the port city which is the largest ever in our history and which came at a time where we badly needed investment after ending a violent conflict and uh, also a key factor that we have to focus is conflict prevention in Sri Lanka because Sri Lankans in general are <laughs> conflict uh, positive they will always try Prone to towards conflict right? indeed <laughs> so Chinese donations or grants or assistance 
I think are tools for conflict prevention, like for example, the port city, the Hambantota sea and airports, the highways, the rail tracks, all these infrastructure facilities, hospitals, we can use them to keep the lowest level of the social pyramid as well as the upper levels involved in some sort of activity that will uh, contribute to lasting development, st sustainable development and lasting peace. So 21st century and the BRI, to my view, is the best tool for conflict prevention. And also I must note that China's economic dual circulation policy, which means that uh, they develop their internal trade economy and with that surplus, they develop the, the external trade facilities and the external trade capacities. So the, it, it has created, it is creating a cascading effect. So it's up to us to use that in the coming century, because as I said, 700 years ago, they indirectly helped us to establish the longest serving administration which lasted for 50 years, uh, starting early 400, 1400s for 50 years, the rule of Parakramabahu VI, who incidentally resided in Mirihana, the present day Mirihana. So we can use the BRI in the 21st century for conflict prevention, which I think is the most important thing that Sri Lanka should focus as a small nation to achieve uh, economic growth. Very true. When we look at a particular project that President Xi Jinping initiated, the Belt and Road Initiative, it was called the One Belt, One Road, now it's called the BRI. It's been eight years in, into implementation. We're going yes. back to 2013, as you rightly mentioned. It has been talked about, debated, there's been criticism, there's been praise, uh, there's been doubt about it. Uh, how effective has it been? It's only eight years into operationalization, but yes. how effective has it been to date in terms of involving Sri Lanka also in this much bigger plan of theirs? Well, as you said, uh, BRI is based on the ancient Silk Road and uh, the roads as they interpret are the sea routes. The belts are the land routes. So the belt focuses on Central Asia towards the Middle East and Europe. And then there's another belt going down the Mekong towards uh, the Far East or the South China Sea. And then the road that is co coming down South China Sea, passing Sri Lanka towards the Middle East and uh, through the Suez Canal to Europe. And then there are other bells going to the US and to the European Union, etc. So this trade activity has, uh, from 2013 up to 2020, China has traded with uh, 140 plus partners of the BRI initiative with an amount of $10 trillion, uh, totaling up to $10 trillion. And Chinese investments in these uh, organizations and partner countries up to 2020 has become has been somewhere around 140 billion dollars and uh, most importantly during 2020 during the covid uh, pandemic it was the belt and road that kept most of the central asian even european asian and some of the south american and all, most all African governments, states, up and running with their medical supplies. The longest railroads that starts from China and which is uh, ending up in Europe, took the medical supplies, vaccines, masks, you name it. Uh, they are sometimes referred to as the metal camels of the modern Silk Road because it was camels which took the stuff uh, during uh, the ancient Silk Road. So now, after eight years, it has proven that it has paid its uh, dividends, especially when the entire planet came to a standstill with the coronavirus. So I'm uh, very much positive that it will continue to uh, help the entire world stand up again on its own, just the way it did, in, uh, just the way the Russians did in uh, 1919. 
That's an amazing point there when you talk about that connect, you talk about the metal camels. That's an interesting uh, term to use there because this is where this country is working very closely with countries across the world despite the criticism that some of those countries level against China and you don't exactly see that same criticism from China towards those other countries. Um, they want to work with China but they also want to go about criticizing the country. Yes. But of course the BRI is something that is sti still evolving but it's I guess some point that I want to come to in our next segment is also that whole understanding of strategy. They yes. planned it out so well in terms of connectivity to every corner of the world. It's not just their neighborhood, not just Asia, but they are gone all the way to South America. Yes. Where probably the Silk Road never extended that far, but exactly. they've taken it under this new leadership, under this new plan in to those areas. In so fact, uh, if I may interrupt you, it has reached the orbit and even planet Mars. So now the Chinese can deliver your satellite or anybody's satellite to the orbit and very soon they may even deliver stuff to planet Mars. This is the amazing part of progress. When we return with the Sri Lankan understanding, we're going to be looking at the future. We're going to be at the potential. Where does Sri Lanka fit into this? What is the position of Sri Lanka? What is the role that this country can play? And what can we expect in the years ahead? When we return with the Sri Lankan understanding, we're in conversation with Professor Samita Hettige. We're looking at Sri Lanka and the BRI and examining the path ahead. Welcome back to the Sri Lankan Understanding. We are in conversation with Professor Samita Hettige and we are focusing on Sri Lanka and the BRI. Professor, when we look at Sri Lanka in the BRI, in the bigger plan, we are a key node, no doubt, but we are not the only node. Yes. You've got to be mindful of that too. But what are the challenges our country has to overcome to engage in this initiative? It's not clear cut, most unfortunately. Uh, we are also a democracy, we've got a different ideology, a different system of uh, operation in our country. What are some of the main challenges we are facing in our engagement in the BRI? Yes, we must remember that there are 28 plus countries in the Indian Ocean Rim competing with each other to get the benefits of the BRI and most of them are democracies. So, firstly we should uh, be flexible enough to Think like, learn from people like Pakistan, countries like Pakistan where they have a joint consultative mechanism to successfully implement the China-Pakistan economic corridor projects, which is a key feature of the BRI initiative. We can learn from Pakistan. Our political parties can come together in the interest of national long-term development. Then. We must remember that, especially during these days, China donating us so many millions of vaccines, it's actually indirectly helping us to open up the country and start our economic activity again. We have to use that rather than criticizing which is good, which is bad. I, I know personally, I know some people who don't take the Chinese vaccine because they're ch against Chinese politics or something like that. So those, uh, I think Sri Lankans should start thinking again. And also, now we have so many religions in this country being practiced, predominantly Buddhist. But uh, we, we can learn from the Hainan case study. The Hainan is a tropical, tropical island which belongs to China. And China is going to develop it as a free trade port. And uh, for the, during the last two and a half years, Hainan has attracted more than $5 billion of investment, international investment. So why can't we think like that and be flexible? Because the philosophy can be protected when the economy, is prosper, prosper, economy prospers. And also we have to learn from uh, them about fertilizer. Now there is a fertilizer issue. China first developed the hybrid rice and now they are harvesting, if I am not mistaken, about 500 kilograms from one hectare using their fertilizer, their, their own fertilizer. So there was some discussion about 
people, Sri Lanka bringing in low quality Chinese fertilizer, etc. In fact, they don't want to, they don't have the, I don't think they will ever try to forcefully export uh, fertilizer to anybody because they need it to feed their population. We must not forget that they alleviated poverty by raising more than 100 million people by 2020, where they reached their first centenary goal. The first centenary goal of the Communist Party of China was to alleviate poverty in China. And uh, we have to also remember the, uh, our financial situation. Whatever said and done, we do have problems. So now there are new instruments like the Asia in Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB, which I think will very soon replace the Asian Development Bank and most of the lending um, organizations. So that, and we must remember that AIIB is lending money to countries like Switzerland, European countries, India for that matter. So if India can work with China, and we have to also remember that China is very closely transacting when it comes to trade with India. They have a special thing called the Chennai Connect. If you remember two years ago, Chinese president was visiting Nepal, which is another good partner of the BRI. But before landing in Nepal, he touched base with India, met President uh, Prime Minister Modi in Chennai, and then took the flight to reach Nepal, because Nepal is, uh, is an important nod mm. on the Tibetan belt. And uh, as a small country, we also have to study their other success stories like the technological developments. They have 5G, uh, even 6G now, technology. We can always uh, learn from them, work with them and borrow their technology. I mean, they will always uh, support us if they need. Because we have to remember, George, that the Belt and Road Initiative will flow. China will flourish. China will develop, whether we are in or out. It is our responsibility to grab the opportunities. Because uh, right now, Queen Elizabeth II, the aircraft carrier is in South China Sea. US is withdrawing their forces from Afghanistan. So those who are against Chinese development may also do things. We should be smart enough, like Lee Kuan Yew, to trade with the Chinese, but to maintain balance with the Western powers. I think we should be able to do that because we were culturally with the British for such a long time. And uh, we were again culturally with the Chinese also for a much longer time. So those are the threats and the opportunities because the U.S. Navy is now focusing on the Indo-Pacific region. So that uh, if we can keep in mind that those things, that will be the Absolutely. Best. Professor, recently you also mentioned the centenary, the Communist Party of uh, China. Uh, before we end, you also brought out a publication earlier this year. Yes. This is the only one that has come out, I think, in Sri Lanka to mark this anniversary. Uh, could you tell us briefly about that publication? Yes, I was... Uh, I, my intention was to educate uh, Sri Lankans and uh, English uh, people who can read and understand English about the developments down the Belt and Road and China's efforts to uh, develop their own country, so where we can learn. And, uh, and, in, and it's named, uh, the moon is not in the water, okay. which is again a Chinese saying that we cannot uh, reach the moon by just looking at water, but we have to work hard. They have proved that. In 2020, they reached the moon. Chinese flag is now flying on the moon. And they even sent uh, rice uh, to the moon in those ships, in the spaceships, and tested them whether they can be cultivated in the moon. So as uh, somebody said in Sri Lanka that if there's scarcity, they will get the rice from the moon, we <laughs> might be able to get it. <laughs> Absolutely. We're probably going to prove uh, old sayings or Indeed. promises that were made uh, many, many decades ago in the 70s, if I'm not mistaken. So this is, that's a very interesting point there, Professor, and the title of your book, uh, The Chinese Saying Itself, we've got to stop looking at the reflection and actually start focusing on the goal. Where are we getting to? That's exactly. where strategizing comes into the picture. Exactly. 
We've been discussing the whole process of understanding the BRI, understanding the role Sri Lanka can play in it. As uh, Professor Hettige mentioned to me on a previous occasion as well, I think China does not exactly need us as much as we need China. We've got to be very clear on that, Professor. I think that's probably one of the key takeaways from this particular session, because at the end of the day, that country is working with countries around the world, irrespective of their locality, irrespective of their geography or their relationship, ideology, form of government, etc. This is where Sri Lanka has a lot to gain from the BRI. And the sooner we start incorporating ourselves into it and benefiting, but making sure that we are getting something out of it. We've got to go in there with a strategy of what we are going to derive from this bigger initiative. Thank you very much, Professor Hettige, for joining us on the Sri Lankan Understanding. And thank you for taking time to watch this particular episode. Join us again next time when we focus on another area, another potential for the country as we go into the future. <laughs>